For 300,000 years, they were the undisputed kings of a frozen continent. Strong, intelligent, and perfectly adapted, they were the Neanderthals. But around 50,000 years ago, a new challenger arrived in their land, a taller, more slender species hailing from Africa, us, Homo sapiens. For 10,000 years, perhaps longer, these two humanities shared the same world, hunted the same prey, and endured the same ice storms. But in the end, only one survived. What happened during that long period of coexistence? Was it a war of extermination or a silent, relentless competition? Which skills, tools, and strategies decided the fate of the planet? Today, we put the two greatest fighters of prehistory head to head in a definitive survival showdown. In one corner of the ring, the long reigning champion, the master of the Ice Age, the Neanderthal. Their anatomy was a masterpiece of adaptation to extreme cold. They were, on average, shorter than us, with males standing around 5 foot 5 and incredibly more robust, weighing up to 175 pounds of pure muscle and bone. Their chests were barrel-shaped and their pelvis was wider. Research from paleoanthropologists like Chris Stringer of the Natural History Museum in London shows that this physique wasn't just for strength, but to conserve heat in the brutal climate of glacial Europe. Following Bergman's rule, where more voluminous bodies lose less heat, their noses were wide and projecting, acting as a radiator to warm and humidify the dry, freezing air before it reached their lungs. And their brains? On average, they were slightly larger than ours, reaching up to 1,600 cubic centimeters. For 300,000 years, they were the masters of Europe, perfectly adapted to their world. In the other corner, the newly arrived challenger from Africa, Homo sapiens, also known in Europe at this time as the Cro-Magnon. Our anatomy was the opposite. We were taller and noticeably more slender. We weren't built for the cold, but for energy efficiency and endurance. Our long legs, narrow pelvis, and elastic Achilles tendons were adaptations forged for running long distances on the African savannas. This efficiency had a crucial advantage. Our longer limbs and lighter bodies required, according to biomechanical studies, up to 30% fewer calories to move compared to a Neanderthal. In times of scarcity, this fuel economy was an immense advantage. Our brains were slightly smaller in volume, around 1,400 cubic centimeters, but as we'll see, size isn't everything. We were the invaders, strangers in a land that was not our own, a tropical species trying to survive in Europe's freezer. A battle for survival is one with the right tools, and here we see the first major strategic difference between the two competitors. The Neanderthal arsenal was based on the Mousterian industry. Their tools were effective, robust and versatile. They were masters of the Levallois technique, producing sharp flakes and spear points from a skillfully prepared stone core. The typical Neanderthal tool was like a heavy-duty Swiss army knife, a single piece of stone often held in the hand that served to cut meat, scrape hides, and pierce wood. It was powerful, but it had a crucial disadvantage. It was heavy, required high-quality raw material found locally, and most importantly, it demanded close contact with the prey. Their spears, though well-made, were thick and heavy, designed for thrusting, not for being thrown accurately over long distances. Their fight was always up close and personal, a battle of brute force. The Homo sapiens arsenal, on the other hand, represented a revolution. Arriving in Europe, they brought with them the Aurignacian industry. 
The key words here are efficiency, specialization, and miniaturization. Instead of a single, heavy, multi-purpose tool, we produced a variety of long, thin stone blades. From a single block of stone, we could produce many more feet of sharp cutting edge than a Neanderthal. And from these blades, we created specialized, delicate tools for every task. End scrapers for hides, burins for engraving bone, perforators for drilling holes. More importantly, we mastered other materials. Archaeological sites like Vogelhurt Cave in Germany show that Homo sapiens crafted tools from bone, antler and ivory with incredible precision. They created the first bone needles with eyes. This may seem simple, but it's a transformative technology. Needles allowed them to sew together fitted, layered clothing from animal skins, creating a wearable technology that was far more effective against the cold than the simple cloaks Neanderthals likely wore. With better clothes, we spent fewer calories staying warm and could hunt for longer in harsh weather. And the greatest technological advantage of all? We invented the first true, complex projectile weapons. Not just lighter throwing spears, the great innovation was the atlaut, or spear thrower. As demonstrated by experimental archaeologists, this simple rod of wood or bone acted as a lever, an extension of the arm, allowing a hunter to launch a light bone-tipped dart with incredible speed and force, hitting targets over 30 meters away with lethal accuracy. The Neanderthal had to get close enough to feel a bison's breath, we could kill from across a stream. The Neanderthal had a knife. We had a rifle. On one side, robust tools for close quarters combat. On the other, light, specialized tools and long-range weapons. If you were in the Ice Age, which toolkit would you choose to survive? The Neanderthals or the Homo sapiens? Leave your choice in the comments. With such different arsenals, their hunting and survival strategies were also distinctly distinct. Neanderthals were hypercarnivores, specialists in hunting the largest and most dangerous animals of the Ice Age. Mammoths, woolly rhinos, bison. They were ambush hunters. Using the cover of the landscape, like forests and valleys, they would get close to their prey and use their immense physical strength and courage to deliver the fatal blow with their heavy spears. It was an effective strategy, but an extremely dangerous one. The analysis of Neanderthal fossils, like the famous research by Eric Trinkus, shows a pattern of injury very similar to that of modern rodeo riders. Fractures to the skull, arms, pelvis, and legs. They were constantly being trampled, gored, and thrown through the air by their prey. Every meal was a brutal battle that could cost them their lives or leave them permanently maimed. Homo sapiens, on the other hand, hunted smarter, not harder. With the atlatl, we could take down large animals from a distance, minimizing the risk of direct confrontation. But our greatest advantage was flexibility. We weren't specialists in one thing. We were supreme generalists. Isotopic analysis of bones and food remains in our camps show a much broader and more diverse diet. Besides mammoths and reindeer, we ate fish. Evidence of bone fish hooks and barbed harpoons is common. We hunted birds like geese and ptarmigan. And we even captured small, fast prey like rabbits and hares, likely using traps and nets. Technologies that require planning and patience, but are low risk. This diverse diet made us far more resilient. If a major large animal species migrated or declined due to climate change, Neanderthals faced a crisis. We simply changed the menu. But the biggest difference of all wasn't in the muscles or the tools, but in the mind. For a long time, it was thought that Neanderthals were less intelligent, but that's a myth. Their brains were huge. So what was the difference? Modern science, especially genetics, has given us the answer. Social structure. Genetic studies of ancient DNA, 
led by pioneers like Svante Pabo of the Max Planck Institute, have analyzed the genomes of different Neanderthals and found a troubling pattern of low genetic diversity and signs of inbreeding. This suggests that Neanderthals lived in small, isolated family groups, perhaps 10 to 20 individuals, and were highly isolated. They were clans that rarely interacted with others. Homo sapiens, in contrast, lived in larger groups and, crucially, created vast social networks that could connect hundreds of individuals. The archaeological proof for this is overwhelming. At Homo sapiens sites in France, we find seashells from the Mediterranean, hundreds of kilometers away. We find high-quality flint and amber that traveled across entire regions. This shows that different groups met at specific locations, exchanged gifts, information, technology, and likely partners, thus avoiding inbreeding. And why is this so important? A larger social network acts as an insurance policy. If your group is starving because of a harsh winter, you can rely on help from a neighboring group with whom you have an alliance. More importantly, a larger network is a larger collective brain. Innovations like a new hunting technique or the invention of the needle didn't die out with a small group. They spread rapidly through the network, benefiting everyone. And this ability to create larger networks was linked to our final great advantage, advanced symbolic thought. Both groups used symbols. Neanderthals used eagle talons as ornaments and perhaps made rudimentary cave paintings like those found in Spain. But Homo sapiens experienced a creative explosion, what some call the human great leap forward. The caves of Chauvet and Lascaux in France, with their 30,000-year-old masterpieces of cave art, weren't just pretty. They were ceremonial centers, prehistoric cathedrals. The art, the music, bone flutes are common at our sites. The complex jewelry, the Venus figurines, all of this served as a social glue. It created shared mythologies, group identities, and rules that allowed thousands of people who were not direct relatives to trust each other and cooperate. The Neanderthal had a family. We had a tribe. The mind and society seemed to have been the deciding factor. What do you think was more important for our victory? The ability to invent better weapons or the skill to create strong friendships and social networks? Leave your opinion. So what happened in the end? There is no evidence of a large-scale genocidal war. The confrontation was far more subtle. It was a 10,000-year competition for resources, and Homo sapiens was simply a superior competitor. Imagine two athletes. The Neanderthal was a power lifter, incredibly strong in their specialty, but less adaptable and with a high energy cost. The Homo sapiens was a decathlete, very good at 10 different things, more efficient and more flexible. In a stable world, the specialist can win, but the world of the Ice Age was anything but stable. Our long-range weapons gave us more food with less risk. Our varied diet protected us from starvation when a specific prey vanished. Our sewn clothing kept us warmer and more mobile and our social networks gave us a safety net against catastrophe. When extreme climate events, like the Heinrich Entz events, caused abrupt and devastating climate shifts, our groups could rely on help from distant relatives. The small, isolated groups of Neanderthals had nowhere to turn. Slowly, over millennia, they were pushed into smaller and smaller refuges, like the coast of Gibraltar, until, around 40,000 years ago, the last of them disappeared. But the story doesn't end with a total extinction. The same genetics that told us about their social structure gave us one last shocking revelation. We interbred. The analysis of the genome of a 45,000-year-old Homo sapien from Siberia, known as the ust Ishim man, showed he had a recent Neanderthal ancestor. This proves these encounters happened. Most modern non-African humans carry between 1 and 3% Neanderthal DNA. 
We won the battle for survival, but we absorbed a part of their people in the process. They aren't entirely extinct. They live on, in small fragments, inside of us. The clash of titans wasn't won by brute force, but by innovation, flexibility, and above all, by friendship. And if you want to gain more knowledge about the epic battles and incredible survival stories that shaped who we are, then your journey is just beginning. Continue this exploration with us. Subscribe to Extinct Doc and hit the bell so you don't miss a single chapter of our past. Leave a like if this story changed your view of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens and share this video with everyone who loves a good clash of titans. Your interaction is vital for us to continue unearthing the secrets of prehistory. Thank you for watching and see you next time.